Welcome to the second episode of the Western Outdoor News Podcast. Three cool things we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about the cover shot. I'm sure everybody's seen it. And if you haven't, you should definitely subscribe to Western Outdoor News or run to your local tackle shop and pick up a copy. Such a cool story about the cover shot this week. I can't wait for everybody to hear it. Number two on our list this week, we sit down with Juan editors Blake Warren and Mike Stevens to talk about the string of gigantic striper and bass that have been coming out of Southern California and Central California to see what's going on there and which lakes you guys should be looking out for. And if you've ever wondered what happens to a fish after you release it and what kind of life it lives, how far away it's able to swim after you release it, then this episode is for you. You're definitely going to want to stick around for our conversation with Roxanne Wilmer of Gray Fish Tag Research. They use some tags that cost $5,000 they shove them into a striped bass and they see where it ends up. And the things that they've found have actually shifted the way that some people have thought about fishing. So definitely stick around for that one. But first, let's get into this week's cover shot. So picture this. This seems like every angler's dream. You plan an international vacation and on that vacation, you contact a local fishing guide. You want to do some fishing. You're on vacation, right? Well, that guide takes you to Pyramid Lake and you catch an 11.3 pound largemouth, personal best, and you land on the cover of Western Outdoor News. Well, that's exactly what happened to Raul Martin. He is living his dreams right now on the cover of Western Outdoor News with his personal best largemouth bass. Um, I mean, you can hear the excitement in his voice. He left a quick voicemail. Let's take a listen. Hi, this is Ron Martin. I'm very grateful and honored to be on the cover of Western Outdoor News. This has to be my most iconic catch in my 22 years of fishing. As mentioned in my article, the moment the fish took my swim bait, I thought I had snuck a branch. A second or two later, my rod bent like crazy. It was an amazing fight. Holding an 11 pound bass in my hands was an incredible experience and a dream come true. I'm also thankful for all the support and advice that Fernando and Lorenzo from Guppies Fishing have given to me. And a special thanks to Western Outdoor News for being featured on the front cover. Speaking of Pyramid Lake and double-digit bass, Southern California and Central California have seen some massive fish these days. So what's going on, guys? What have you heard? Well, last week's cover shot, we had a pretty cool story. Uh, Raul Martin, he speaks very little English from Madrid, <laughs> Spain, but he wanted to come out to L.A. and fish for a personal best double-digit largemouth. Sure enough, he hooked up with a guy named Lorenzo Sandoval of Guppy's Fishing Adventures. Went out there, and they were throwing the HUD, committed all day to the 8-inch Hudson Deluxe, connected with 10 fish from shore, and he got his PB, 11.3 pounds, with another 9 fish. Yeah, I mean, talk about a trip of a lifetime, coming over from from Spain and catching a fish that locals would love to catch. Oh, guys that have been out there for three, four, five winters that haven't caught that fish. Yeah, he just comes out of nowhere just like that. And also lands on the cover of Western Outdoor News. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah, he's pretty thrilled about it. Yeah, so there's this isn't just the only big fish that's come out of these lakes recently. There's been a, a, a huge string of them. So what are some other lakes that we've been seeing some of these big catches? Well, sticking with Pyramid, that it wasn't just largemouth. There was at least two stripers over 17. And if you're seeing pictures of two over 17, you can bet that there's a handful more over 10. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a trout stock, stock early in the week. Definitely spark that thing absolutely a lot of people uh out there throwing those trout imitations and getting those big fish uh so that's pyramid lake uh where else has been producing lately these days um there was a pretty cool story um up at diamond valley lake uh first time striper angler diana cortez um she she always fishes every year on her birthday and this year she wanted to try to catch a striper and she headed to diamond valley lake and she was throwing a swim bait and connected to a 25 pounder. Um, we also had that one in the paper. It wasn't yeah. any. It wasn't any expensive special swim bait. And what, what's weird about it is 
that big swim bait bite really hasn't been at Diamond Valley at this year, despite the fact that trout are going in. Mm-hmm. The numbers have been there. Smaller fish are being caught on like trolled flies and small jerk baits on light tackle and stuff yeah, like this. Yeah, it's almost but, like a transition from that smaller bait to these to now we're starting to see these big bait fish come. Yeah, out. hopefully this is a sign of the first of more to come this season because it got off to a slow start as far as like the trophy size fish. Um, although the guys, um, the guys at the lake, when they send reports, they're always telling me that the big fish always patrol the marina when they're stocking trout. So they're out there, you know, they just haven't been biting. Um, but that was a good one. Um, down in, uh, North San Diego County, Lake Poway had another swim bait fish, um, was a 10.1 pound largemouth, And this guy, um, caught one throwing a swim bait from shore. And I've been saying for a while now that I think Poway may emerge a uh, big bass swim bait lake like it used to be because unlike a lot of the other lakes right now, they're stocking smaller trout. So while like big fish lakes like Dixon and Wolford and Diamond Valley, you know, they're stocking two to five pounders and even bigger. um, I haven't heard of a trout over three pounds caught at Poway yet this year. Wow. So if they're stocking the smaller models, you know, the swim baits that people throw are going to match the hatch. And I just, I think good things are going to come out of Poway this year on the um, bass scene. Yeah, definitely a, a lake to watch out for in, in North San Diego. Uh, but speaking about Central California, there was a, a big story out of Millerton Lake, which is not a lake that you hear about very fre- frequently. It's about 15 miles north of Fresno, and there were some big striper being pulled out of that lake. Uh, what did we hear about that, guys? Well, I don't know about how many there are, but one cool story we had was uh, former Raider quarterback Daryl LaMonica. He's a old-time Millerton fisherman. He's been fishing there for a long time. And uh, guide Rusty Brown was up there running some trips, so he took his dad up to fish with Daryl. And Rusty gave him a four-and-a-half-inch prison shad robo-worm. Guy <laughs> put it on a dart head, went up river, and hooked up to a 20-pound striper at 35 feet, so... It's definitely a case of elephants eating peanuts. <laughs> exactly. All right. Any other uh, any other lakes to watch out for? Um, all I could say is just from from my reporting over the last few weeks, um, the sources I have at these two lakes, Paris and Otai, um, it's been a pretty standard winter bite so far with most bass being caught deep. But um, some of the guides I talked to, and anglers that fish both of those lakes were just starting to see what they thought were the first indications of some largemouth bass starting to shallow up. Um, there weren't very many of them, and you know it's going to take you know a week straight of warm weather to for anything noticeable to happen out of that. But it's a good sign for two lakes that historically will spawn earlier than a lot of the other lakes in Southern California. So. Those are two lakes to keep an eye on if um, you like getting an early start to the spring bite. All right. Thanks for the update, guys. So next up on the list, we sit with Roxanne Wilmer of Gray Fish Tag Research. She pulls the curtain back and shows us some of the cool stuff that they're able to find with their tagging program. And again, those $5,000 tags on some of the fish that they have that are able to detect depth. And she gets into it, but... Here she is, Roxanne Wilmer with Great Fish Tag Research. A lot of times when a fish is tagged and released and then recovered, there's that initial excitement as that phone call comes in. Um, You know, I'm so excited to enter in that original tag data and find out that location. And sometimes that fish is just caught maybe sometimes the day before or the week before. So their migration hasn't gone far or their growth hasn't increased. But we've learned a lot even from that tag. What we've learned from that tag in in a short period is that the way that fish was caught, handled, released, 
has allowed that fish to survive and obviously eat again. So we gain knowledge at all aspects of the tagging. However, some really exciting ones are the recoveries that there's distances. So for instance, last year we had a recapture rate of 4.7% and your average recapture rate in spaghetti tagging is anywhere between one and 2%. So we had an incredible recapture uh, rate last year. So what what, really quick, what do you mean? What do you mean when you say recapture? The original fish is caught, then tagged and released. So then, when another angler is out fishing, they capture that fish that has the tag in it. Okay. So once they capture that fish that has a tag on it, on that tag it has a GFR code, a gray fish tag research code, and our phone number. So that angler records that information and then they contact us and that's what we call a recapture. Okay. So if you're ever out and you catch and you catch a fish that's been tagged, what what does this tag actually look like? I know we're it's, we're using audio so I can't just show everybody, but if you could do your best to describe what these tags look like so people can look out sure. for that. Sure. Yeah, the original description is spaghetti tag. So it's a thin um spaghetti sized um tag that has a dart on the other end of it that gets fixed or deployed into the into the fish. You don't see that. You see the end of that. And our particular tags are neon green. So they stand out. And then on them, as mentioned, it's printed our code, our tagging code, which starts with GFR, and then our contact information, our website, and our phone number. Awesome. Okay. Okay, so back to the the other story. So, what was a four percent uh, catchback, or or what was yeah. the term you used? Yeah, four four point seven percent recapture rate recapture. in 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 twenty twenty. So, uh, the program in twenty twenty tagged twenty one hundred and eighty fish. There were sixty three species of fish, and there was a hundred and two recaptures. So that brings our percentage rate to four point seven. Okay. And that's considered, that's a pretty good recapture rate considering, geez, look at the size of the ocean. I mean, for getting 4% of your fish back is, is pretty incredible. It is. It's really incredible. A lot of times, you know, it depends on the type of species that you're tagging. Like for instance, like if it's a reef fish, which is considered to be a residential with, you know, staying amongst its location or what they call a um, highly migrating species, which obviously is known to travel. So it depends on the species that you're tagging on what your percentage rates will be, but our overall program was a 4.7. Okay, so so more specifically, uh, let's jump into, like I saw videos online of you guys tagging striper on the East Coast. What have you guys found or learned about the, the striper in, in New York? Yes. Well, that in itself, Brad, that has been a study that has taken on a life of its own. So that particular study, we started it in 2019. We partnered with the Fisherman Magazine and Navionics. And what we did there was not spaghetti tagging. It's what we called satellite tagging. So the satellite tagging is a totally different tagging um, deployment And what we did there is we took two post-spawn striped bass out of the Hudson River, and we satellite tagged those fish. Now, the striped bass is known to be a coastal inshore fish. Um, It's a very popular fish. It's uh, very generational. Some of the captains and anglers that I talk to, they're always telling stories about when they were with their grandpa and their or their parents, how they taught them the fish, etc. So this particular fish could be caught um, at the shore uh, on a jetty. It could be on the you know on the surf casting or obviously offshore. So we tagged two striped bass, and those two satellite tags showed that that fish or those two fish migrated well offshore, a hundred plus miles offshore, which oh, blows. Wow. Yes, which blows any theory of the coastal migration. So that in itself was a tremendous groundbreaking study. Mm-hmm. So, so the the results of all these tags are to to find things like this and to open your guys' eyes to to where these fish are being found. 
so what's the total end goal here? Is it is it more f- towards conservation or finding more fish? Or It's really awareness, right? So because conservation comes down the line. So if we can bring awareness to anglers, uh, we're not saying the fish, we're saying please fish. But we're, what we're saying is that if, you know, if you catch seven fish and you're going to eat seven fish and the eighth one you didn't bring on the boat, then tag it. Because what we can do is we can bring awareness to different uh, species and awareness will bring sustainability. And then obviously end result will be conservation. So our program really focuses on awareness. Mm -hmm. I know that gray is in fish tagging, but you guys are also known for gray taxidermy. How do the two combine and work together? Well, Great Taxidermy has been in business for 57 years doing replica fish mounds. And that's where the relationship of 10,000 captain and mates have come. So because we've had the ear of the fishermen and we know the challenges that they uh, experience, Great Fish Tag Research came alongside of them to give relevant data to fishery managers. It sounds like there's a lot of con- conservation and just ensuring that generations to come can catch a fish and that we're not depleting the resource here. Absolutely. The um, the the fish mounting business um, has changed throughout the years. So there's everything that comes out of their shop is a custom work of art, basically. Um, the angler, you know, will send a photograph and we have where they have custom mounts made that will precisely identify that particular fish and that person can put that on on their on their wall as a trophy Mm -hmm. so speaking of trophies uh at the end of last year of 2020 we had the western outdoor news cabo tuna jackpot and uh Gray Fish Tag was a sponsor of the event. We we actually supplied you guys with a um, a check recently as as kind of gratitude after the uh, after the tuna jackpot. What do donations mean to you guys, and and what can be done with that money that is has been donated? Yeah, absolutely. The Western Outdoor News has come alongside of us and partnered with us. And uh, absolutely, that check came in and, and we, our program just doesn't operate without funding. So because we are committed to coming alongside of the professional sport fishing charter captain and offering them tagging supplies for free, and that our program is not a membership-based program, everything that we offer, the data that we collect from our data cards, from our um, Um, satellite tags is offered for free. So the only way we can run this program is by sponsorships. So those sponsorship dollars allow us to buy supplies and buy tags and and deploy tags and train captains and mates, etc. So our program just wouldn't operate without donations. Uh, so going back to some more specific stories, my favorite part about this whole fish tagging thing is to hear the incredible stories about the fish being caught in one place and then being retrieved at another. Can you tell us some more stories maybe about the billfish that you've caught in, uh, in Mexico and tagged uh, and where they've ended up around the world? I'm glad you asked because I didn't really catch on touch on that when the last time we talked about it. So I was going to come back around myself. So yes, um, last year, some noteworthy recaptures. Um, one was a striped marlin. So a striped marlin was tagged at our research center, Pisces Sport Fishing in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. And then it was recovered in Capos, Costa Rica at our research center, Marina Pez Villa. So couple things there obviously a true migration of that fish and then the collaboration of two our, of our research centers working together with their anglers in their area to get us that information so that was an incredible recapture mm-hmm. we also had a couple um here in the states we had an amberjack that was tagged in fort lauderdale florida and then recovered in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. So uh, that was an impressive one. Uh, Another one was um, a barracuda. We had a barracuda that was tagged in Fort Lauderdale and recovered on little TB Island in Georgia. So those are always great when you have that long distance tagging. 
Yeah, and especially for for Barracuda, I think that is that is so cool to hear because uh, not a lot of people talk about Barracuda. I feel like, and then when you hear a story like that, it's like, wow, these are. I mean, it's an incredible fish, and it's incredible to hear the the distance that they've that they travel just trying to uh, you know live their lives. Um, I, I also saw that you guys tag redfish and roosterfish, which are so interesting as well. What what have you guys learned about those two species? Well, the roosterfish was um, another satellite tagging program that we've done in Costa Rica and Capos, Costa Rica. And that, in addition to the striped bass, told us that that rooster is a migrating fish also. We did a study in 2018. We were the first to satellite tag long deployments for roosterfish. And that roosterfish traveled from Costa Rica into Nicaragua. So it was like a 300 and plus mile trip. Wow. Um, yeah, again, for a fish that was known to be or is known to be a coastal resident type of fish. And, and just, again, just drives home the importance of catch and release because, geez, if, if you hadn't if you hadn't released that fish, it couldn't have traveled 300 miles and, and gone on to live this incredible life and then be maybe recaptured again down the road and made somebody else's day. Absolutely. You know what happens, too, is fi- the fisheries is, I don't know the dollar amount, but there's many, many businesses that thrive on tourism for that prized, sought-after rooster fish. Mm-hmm. So when you when you go to these areas that rooster fish, you know, are known to be, you are supporting you know, marinas and local captains and mates, etc. That their business thrives on that game fish. So that is, you know, obviously um, the benefits of catch and release. So the the fish are there for generations. Yeah, it helps uh, helps a whole economy thrive. I mean, uh, around the world, it's not even just down the street; it's around the whole world. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. You know, there's there's many many of our research centers that come alongside of us realize that they they operate based upon you know that particular species of fish, and without that in their in their waters, they wouldn't have people traveling all over the world to visit them. You've mentioned again with the uh, the satellite tag as opposed to the spaghetti tag. What information can you guys get from a, from a satellite tag that you can't get from the spaghetti tags? Satellite tags are quite incredible. They, uh, they're very expensive, um, but what they offer you is... How much, uh, out of curiosity, how much does a satellite tag cost? The actual tag itself is probably about a five thousand dollar purchase. Wow! Now, now the cost to you know to go and then the, the rent charter boats and fuel boats and you know all those expenses obviously have to be added to the cost on that. But the actual tag mm-hmm. itself is is about a five thousand dollar purchase. Okay, so there's a lot riding on this uh, on this satellite tag that's been planted on yes, a fish. Yes, so yeah, so exactly. So when you're out fishing for you know to do a deployment of a satellite tag, you know, you first and foremost you want to make sure you have a healthy candidate, you know, so that we when we say a healthy candidate, we want to make sure that that fish wasn't labored on the line as it was being caught. We want to make sure that that fish was hooked properly um, so that that fish is healthy enough to carry that satellite tag. And a satellite tag is programmed for a specific time period. So for instance, um, when we did our striped bass, we did a four month duration time. And during that four months, that tag is gathering what they call geolocation information, which is our migration tracking. It, it records water temperature and depth. And it's programmed every 15 to one minute, depending on what, how, many, how often you want that data set to be recorded. And at a program time, that fish, that tag is released from the fish goes to the surface of the water, and through its antenna, it starts to communicate with the Argos satellites overhead. Argos receives that data, and that data is then processed and then provided back to us, and that's when we're able to put our tracking maps together. Okay, so this isn't the, the data isn't being fed in real time. You have to wait for the the satellite uh, tag to float to the surface, and it will send a beacon with the data to the satellite, and then it will offload all the information that it's collected over its life. 
That is correct. The there are tags out there that what they call GPS coordinates tags, um, but your species has to come to the surface often for that for that GPS track to happen. What they call a ping to happen, and most times your you know your fish are swimming you know underwater. So in the tagging that we've done, it's not a GPS tracking until that data is collected and sent back to us. Okay, so temperature, depth, these are all pretty standard things. Is there anything, we've, we've heard the distance stories, but is there anything interesting that you guys have learned about the temperature or the depth um, aspects of the satellite tags? Sure. Um, for instance, obviously, we've done swordfish, and you know we know that a swordfish, um, which is which has been known, but you know that a swordfish has a daily, you know, um, high up in the water temp, and then obviously deep deep dives. Um, you have the striped bass tag was a tag that we had never. Um, st- tagged before. So any of the information that we got from that was all brand new and, and interesting to us. So we learned, you know, we learned the depths of those fish and, and how far they swim and the water temps that they kind of have, you know, l- like to be in. So there's always, mm-hmm. there, depending upon the species that you're after, the, the knowledge that you gain is always relevant. Okay. Are, are there any specific stories of, of times where you might've been surprised by some of the, 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 uh, the temperature or the depth data? We learned from the striped marlin that there's a certain time of the day that they they are in 150 water depths of water. And so we, we last time we went out, we fished in that in that area of water, that depth of water, and we were more successful. So so by get, gathering this information and sharing it to the public, that's what we hope to do is just kind of educate anglers on, on where the fish are. That's funny. It's almost it's almost like it went full circle. You guys did the research. You went out using the information you found, fished that certain depth, and were able to actually successfully catch more fish using this using this data. So it's almost like it's all coming together, right? That that is the goal. And with this striped bass study, we have a contributor who um, has also been a part of our study and helping us um, and catch the catch our catch our candidates. He's been a striped bass fisherman for 40 plus years and has fished the the waters up in the northeast what we call chasing the fish. So he'll go to Virginia when the fish are there. He'll then take his boat to New Jersey when the fish are there, follow them to New York, etc. And after the data that we shared, he now fishes differently after 40 plus years and his results are incredible. So wow. he, yeah, he reached out to us and says, I just didn't think there was anything else that I could possibly learn about this species. And I'm learning, I'm learning based upon <laughs> from our technology and the wow. science and the science. Yeah. So that's what it's all about. Uh, I mean, that's that's why you guys are doing this, right? I mean, to, to teach everybody more about these fish that we love to catch so much. A hundred percent. Exactly. Exactly. It's really exciting. It's really exciting to be a part of that and sharing it and seeing, and seeing the work that we do get put to use. Yeah. So what's the biggest hurdle when trying to get people to, to join the team and, and start start tagging? What's the biggest hurdle that you guys face? Funding. <laughs> <laughs> Plain and simple. <laughs> is that is that too blunt? Funding. Yeah. yeah. So it's, so the challenge is is funding. You know, we could do so much more. We could engage so many more captains, and we could be in so many more parts of the world if we had the funding. So it's mm-hmm. it's you know just getting sponsors to come alongside and co-brand with us, and it's happening. It's happening. Each one of our sponsors continues year after year with us so it's not as if they you know they join and then a year later they don't renew their sponsorships so research centers which um we have you know as i mentioned to you and then um and then sponsors is how our program operates so you know thanks to them is how our program continues year after year Okay. So, so let's say I wanted to, to start tagging. It's obviously something I have to think about before I catch the fish of the lifetime. So what, what are the steps I could take to start tagging my catches? Well, if you are a recreational angler, you could jump on our website. Um, we have a page that says shop products. You shop 
products, um, which are starter kits that have, you know, applicator sticks along with tags and tag cards. And if you're a captain, then you contact our office and ask for myself and we can help you get started. Uh, the research centers are any tackle centers, marinas, uh, fishing locations worldwide that want to come alongside our mission. And basically what they do is they work with captains and mates within their own area offering tagging supplies. So the same thing, just jump on our website or reach myself at Roxanne at grayfishtag.org, and I'd be more than happy to get anybody started. Okay, so essentially you can you can end up with a kit to to tag your own fish uh, if we if you work through Gray Fish Tag. Sure, sure. Um, we have many many families who are are out on the water with their kids, um, and even not even you know just grown you know adults that that enjoy fishing and. The, the, they see the benefits of tag and release. I've got an angler up in South Carolina who last year tagged 75 sharks. And he says, if I'm going to go out there and catch a you know fish that I'm going to release, why wouldn't I put a tag in it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can name them, right? So if you wanted to name it and, you know, name it in somebody's honor or give it to somebody as a birthday gift, I think that'd be kind of funny. Yeah. It happens all the time. Some of the names that come in, that's one of my, one of the things I do is I'll, I'll you know, I'll call it, ask the angler, like, what was the, um, the story behind that name? All right. Uh, is there any plan to to tag in freshwater like lakes or streams, or is this uh, kind of strictly uh, a saltwater species tagging program? Nope, it's not saltwater at all. We have all species, so freshwater is definitely um, not a problem to, ta- to be tagging with us at all. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. I encourage everybody to go check out the uh, the Gray Fish Tag website and all their content. It's it's really it's really incredible what they put together, and I think it's such a great resource for all anglers. Whether you are, uh, you know, catching redfish, roosterfish, striper, or you know, giant billfish, there's always something to be learned. Thanks again to Roxanne for sharing all that insight. Again, their website is grayfishtagresearch.org. If you go onto this website, it has an interactive map where you can see every fish that they've ever tagged, where they were tagged, the time, everything. And it's, it's such a great resource for all anglers. So thanks again. That's episode two of the Western Outdoor News podcast. Feel free to send us an email at podcast at wonews.com. Questions, comments, concerns, anything that's on your mind, send it to that email address, podcast at wonews.com. Thanks again for listening. See you next week.